Welcome guys, I believe this is the eighth talk in the neurology series and thank you for coming. Today we're going to be talking about myasthenia gravis, which is not a super common disorder, but it's not that rare either. Myasthenia gravis literally translates to grave muscle weakness, which is actually a misnomer because it's not truly a muscle issue, uh, at least not solely. It's more of a communication issue between the nerve and muscle. Anyhow, it's probably likely first identified in uh, Virginia in the mid-1600s. And it was this Native American chief named Opachankano who was repeatedly documented by multiple documenters to have weak limbs and droopy eyelids, eyelids that improved with rest. He was quite a famous uh, chief. He actually lived almost to 100. And amazingly, in, the, in his 90s, he was imprisoned and he was killed in prison by someone. So he was a very active, vigorous man, uh, despite the myasthenia gravis. The first official documentation of this disorder was uh, several decades later by Thomas Willis, who's the fellow who sort of uh, the circle of Willis is actually named after. He was an English doctor who unfortunately wrote his notes about myasthenia in Latin. So they remained rather obscured for about 200 years, which is a pretty long time. And it was not until the 1800s that modern descriptions were made and the disorder, again, somewhat inappropriately named myasthenia gravis, just over 100 years ago. The pathogenesis of myasthenia is a bit uh, complicated, I guess, from one's perspective. From another, it's quite simple. But the journey to find it was... Uh, quite complex. So in the early 1900s, the Scottish physician, Mary Walker, realized that the myasthenia symptoms were almost identical to curare poisoning. And so she thought, well, maybe the thing that we use to help people with curare, the cure for curare, which is a cholinesterase inhibitor, such as peridostigmine, maybe that could help a myasthenia. And she tried it, and it worked. And then this American surgeon, a famous American surgeon, Alfred Boylock, decided he would try to remove a thymic mass because he noticed that a lot of these people with myasthenia had these thymic masses. The thymus is a, is a sort of a gland, uh, part of the immune system up uh, just beneath the sternum and neck. And he removed this mass from a young girl with severe generalized myasthenia and she improved and she maintained her improvement for a number of years. So we started to realize that perhaps an abnormal thymus was part of this disorder. And then only 50 years ago, we actually really started to dig into the pathogenesis and realize that it was an autoimmune response involving antibodies against the nicotinic acetyl acetylcholine receptor, or ACHR, in the neuromuscular junction. So myasthenia gravis hits your voluntary muscles, all right? Not your, your involuntary ones, like the ones that operate your internal organs and your pupils and so on. So that's a very important thing to remember. So if we look at the neuromuscular junction, which is basically the connective structure between nerve and muscle, that is what gets hit in myasthenia. It's not, it looks complicated, this diagram, but it's not. Just follow the red circles. We have a motor nerve axon. We have a motor nerve terminal, the synapse between the nerve and the muscle fiber. So normally you have acetylcholine, which is one of the main neurotransmitters in the central nervous system released from this presynaptic junction at the end of the motor nerve, and it sort of drifts across the synaptic cleft to go to the muscle fiber. Now, in stock standard anti-ACH receptor myasthenia gravis, there are antibodies that target these receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, on the muscle part. You can have a variant of myasthenia called anti-musk myasthenia gravis, where antibodies target a different receptor called the muscle-specific kinase receptor. It has a different function, obviously, but it's, it's nonetheless also vitally important for neuromuscular transmission. Now, you can have disorders that detect the presynaptic junction, so the end of the motor nerve rather than the muscle fiber. So anti-voltage-gated calcium channel antibodies, again, uh, you know, you can get antibodies against those channels in Lambert-Eaton syndrome or LEMS. 
and botulism can also affect the motor nerve terminal. These two disorders affect uh, acetylcholine release rather than the receptor, and they're much rarer. Okay, so that's the general gist of, of myasthenia gravis and its cousins. Now, after we discovered this, we started to develop pretty good treatments for myasthenia gravis. There was prednisone and azathioprine that became established relatively early on. And these were soon followed by intravenous immunoglobulin, or IVIG, in which you provide the patient with a mix of donor antibodies, and plasma exchange, or PLEX, in which their serum is actually replaced with donor serum. And I'll explain why these latter two therapies work very well later. The medical treatments, long and the short of it is, the medical treatments, unlike many other disorders, have been extremely successful for myasthenia gravis. Okay, so we're in the early 1900s. Most people with this disorder died earlier than they should have, uh, usually from respiratory complications when the uh, muscles of respiration were evolved. Now it's a very small number. So people essentially have an, a normal life expectancy with myasthenia gravis, assuming they get the standard of care treatments. So this is a success story in medicine. How do you diagnose it? It's not that easy, but always, like all of the disorders, you rely on the clinical diagnosis, which is history and exam. You confirm what you think based on that pre-test probability using neurophysiology tests, so like nerve conduction studies, EMG, and there's a couple others, and serology, blood tests. And then you image the thymus uh, for a very specific reason as well, to exclude thymic pathology. So the history of myasthenia. Anti-aceate receptor antibody myasthenia is the most common form. That's 85% of these patients. Okay? Anti-musk forms the remainder, and then there's seronegatives as well. There are two hallmarks. One is fluctuating weakness. This is very important. So it's called grave muscle weakness, that's how it translates, but that's incorrect because it's fluctuating weakness is a more important, more specific feature of this disorder. It's painless weakness, and it's not just that they're tired or fatigued. It comes and goes. And even more importantly than that is fatigability. The weakness worsens with repetition and improves with rest. Of course, exercise is going to be the most severe kind of repetition. So these are the two hallmarks of myasthenia. It's not just weakness. A lot of disorders make a person weak. A stroke will make you weak. Um, a myopathy will make you weak, and so on. But it's this fluctuating fatigability. These are the two hallmarks. They can be very strong if they have had an adequate period of rest. OK, so you can see why grave muscle weakness doesn't adequately, adequately uh, describe it. Now, it usually involves many different locations, most commonly the ocular muscles. In fact, many people develop a form of myasthenia gravis called ocular myasthenia gravis, and that can last for a number of years before it generalizes to other parts of the body. So 85% of patients get the eyes involved, I'd say at least that many, and often that presents as ptosis, which is sort of a one or both eyelids are a little bit closed or semi-closed. There's diplopia, double vision. When you describe diplopia, you should describe if it's horizontal or vertical or diagonal, because it implies that different structures are involved. They can also get blurred vision and light sensitivity, which I've been thrown by before. I remember one patient presented with uh, quite a, a fair degree of uh, light sensitivity, and I've thought for that reason it wasn't myasthenia at the time, not really knowing that this was actually a very possible symptom in myasthenia. Bulbar muscles are the next most common group of muscles affected. Over half of patients get dysphagia, so swallowing problems, dysarthria, slurred speech, or dysphonia. Which, um, and uh, th that's quite distinctive, uh, in particular variant of myasthenia called anti-musk myasthenia as well. Face and neck muscles get involved. The person may often appear expressionless, like a myopathy. They might have a horizontal smile. It's not that they're sad. It's just that their facial muscles are very weak. They might have difficulty holding their head up. That's called the dropped head sign. Limb muscles can be involved. If they are, then it's predominantly the proximal muscles, and it can be upper and or lower limbs. And finally, the respiratory muscles can be involved. This is a worrisome complication because this implies that they might not be able to uh, support them, uh, their respiration. So it's life-threatening, 
have to be has to be treated very seriously, and it can be precipitated by um, some of the drugs we treat for other things. So it's good to know these three in particular. I would say before you start them on a person with myasthenia gravis. Now there are other differentials that can present with fluctuating weakness. That first hallmark of myasthenia. It's a good hallmark, but it's not as specific as the fatigability. So fluctuating weakness can appear in the cousins of myasthenia, such as Lambert-Eaton and botulism, those are rare. It can present in thyroid disorders, such as Graves thyroiditis and hypothyroidism. Neuropathies can give you uh, a degree of fluctuating weakness, so Guillain-Barre syndrome, CIDP, and neurosarcoidosis can do this, and myopathies can do this too. So fluctuating weakness alone is, is a hallmark, but it's not the most specific one. It's very rare for any of those differentials, however, to produce fatigability. So fatigability is the most important clinical hallmark. And if you have fatigability, it's going to be myasthenia gravis or maybe anti-musk myasthenia, which is 5 to 7, 10% of patients, almost all of which are female. And it's primarily eyes, bulbar muscles, neck, and respiratory symptoms. And then there's a, the rest of myasthenia gravis is the so-called seronegative myasthenias, that's 5 to 10%, and they can present with uh, ocular or generalized, like the uh, stock standard anti-ACH receptor myasthenia. The myasthenia examination, I start top down, like any clinical exam, so this is useful for the uh, basic physician trainees. At the eyes inspection, you're looking for a unilateral or bilateral ptosis, and importantly, the field's fundi and the pupils, remember those pupil muscles uh, are spared, they all are normal. Eye movements may be impaired. Eye movements are voluntary. So you can get impaired smooth pursuits in one or more directions. It can be very complex. And of course, it may not localize to a cranial nerve territory. It, it probably won't actually, because it's not a cranial nerve problem per se. You can do this thing called the ice test where you place an ice bag against the eyelids for one or more minutes. And we don't know how that works exactly, but it works very well in inhibiting acetylcholinesterase which is the enzyme that breaks down the acetylcholine. It allows it to act longer. Face and neck, moving down, you want to see if they have that expression list or dropped head appearance. Check their neck flexion extension, like you would in myopathy. And again, we check uh, for fatigability. I forgot to mention the fatigability check in the eyes, actually. Uh, we check for sustained up gaze for 30, 60 seconds. You just put your finger in front of their face and lift it up and get them to look up. If, the, if, if they start to get a ptosis or their ptosis gets worse, then that's a positive test for fatigu fatigability in the eyelids. And you can do the same in the neck down below. So you can flex their neck or extend their neck against resistance for 30 to 60 seconds, and then stop and check it again and see if their power is as good as it was when you first started that procedure. And if they have fatigability, it will, of course, be weaker. So this is an example of, you might think it's a unilateral ptosis at first glance. However, it's a bilateral asymmetric ptosis. The patient's right eye is more, uh, the eyelid is more closed than the left. But I don't think the left is quite normal. You see it's obscuring the top third of the iris. And also, I don't know if you can tell, uh, it, it's hard to tell. The patient might be looking a bit to the right. But I think there might be a um, ophthalmo. Uh, paretic issue with the right eye. It might be looking a little bit more to the right and up, but I'm probably speculating there. Now, this is the sustained up gaze test. So this is where you're checking for fatigability. And this is a fellow who uh, looks pretty normal here. He might have a slight bilateral symmetric ptosis, but it, it would be hard, hard to make that call. And anyways, as we do the sustained up gaze, you get him to look up. So a person, the examiner is placing their finger up and the eyes slowly drift down, and now he's got a clear bilateral asymmetric ptosis, the, the right eye is worse. The ice test, so this is a fellow before the ice test, I guess the BI means before ice, yeah. just in case we weren't clear on that. And after the ice test, the eyes are rem open remarkably. I've done, when, when one does this test, I, I can recall doing it a few times, it, it can be remarkable. It sometimes doesn't work very well at all, but it can be remarkable. The myasthenia examination proceeds at the limbs, so check power. And in the upper limbs, I just 
mainly check shoulder abduction and grip, a proximal muscle group and a distal one. And then check fatigability again. So you, you get a theme here of checking fatigability always in myasthenia. So a good way to do it is you get the patient to abduct both the shoulders and you check the power on both quickly, boom. And then you get them to AB, rest one and abduct the other up and down 20 times. So you're trying to tire them out. And then you get them to lift both shoulders again and recheck the power on both. And of course, the one that did the exercise should be weaker if, if there's fatigability. A normal person, it would still be strong, right? But with a person with myasthenia who has fatigability, it'll be weaker. And so that's a pretty good test for that. You can also check their grip for this thing called Lambert sign. You should do it in, if you're doing a short case clinical exam, I guess. In Lambert Eaton, you actually, with after a strong grip and exercise, the power gets stronger. So it's the opposite of myasthenia gravis. And this is for ward patients, not in the exam, but I view this as very important. I often, I will always check re respiratory function once a day if I have an inpatient with myasthenia gravis using this thing called the single breath test. Now, it's of course better to get formal testing, uh, formal uh, spirometry or what, uh, FVC testing, but that, uh, you know, practically speaking, isn't always easily available. Whereas the single breath test is extremely easy to do and not bad. You get the patient to take a deep breath in and then they count out as many numbers as possible at a rate of about one per second. And I demonstrate it for them. And what this does is it approximates their force vital capacity. So if they can count over 25, they have a FVC of at least two liters and they're okay for the ward. If it's 10 to 25, it's one to two liters. Think about HDU. If it's below 10, it's less than one liter, really consider ICU. It's a rough surrogate for the FVC monitoring, but I find it pretty good. Okay, now there are more differentials uh, when you examine a patient that can present with weakness as well. So if you see someone with a unilateral ptosis, don't just think myasthenia. It could be Horner's syndrome or a third nerve palsy. If you see someone with a bilateral ptosis, a major differential is myopathy involving the facial muscles. If you see someone with bulbar symptoms, slurred speech, swallowing issues, probably the main differential is motor neuron disease, but there are many others. Facial weakness, there are certain neuropathies that love to go for the facial nerves, so Guillain-Barre syndrome, CIDP, and neurosarcoidosis being three of the top ones. Myopathy can also give you facial weakness, particularly face, uh, facial involving ones such as FSH dystrophy. Neck weakness, uh, a major differential for neck weakness is myopathy. If you detect limb weakness, motor neuron disease, neuropathy, myopathy are all of course possible. And if you have a positive Lambert sign, that argues for Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome or LEMS. Now, if there's fatigability, this is why the fatigability tests on exam are so important. It's myasthenia. You can basically say it's myasthenia. Now, that being said, of course, there are always other, there are other rare mimics that can do this. So the cousins of myasthenia, uh, uh, Gravis, which are still myasthenic, I guess, LEMS and anti-musk and the seronegative ones. Outside of those, maybe a paramyotonia or a metabolic myopathy, which can get worse with exercise. But really, if you've got fatigability, you can be pretty confident. It's a myasthenic syndrome of which myasthenia gravis is by far the most common. Okay, so after the history and exam, you can do some neurophysiology tests. So we use this one called repetitive neurostimulation. And what we look for, don't worry too much about this, it's just a brief overview. It's looking for something called decrement. If someone asks you in an exam situation, what would you be looking for? Just say decrement. And probably the examiner won't, may not even know what that really means, so you're safe. But basically, when you repeatedly uh, stimulate a motor nerve in a person with myasthenia, you get a smaller action potential with each stimulus. And what this shows on the right here is that the action potential peak uh, gets smaller by at least 10% from the first to final stimulation. And you usually do something like six stimulations, six to five, six to 10. And if you have a greater than 10% drop, that's abnormal. That's decrement positive myasthenia. The sensitivity is pretty good. So if it's a normal test, it doesn't mean it's not myasthenia, okay? It still could be. Not all myasthenia gravis patients will produce this. Single fiber EMG is also an extremely useful test. This looks for just something else, increased jitter. So if an examiner asks you, what are you gonna look for in your single fiber? Increased jitter, and trust me, they almost certainly won't know what that means. So jitter is kind of a difficult concept to understand in a you know, 45 minute lecture, but 
It's the time variation between the action potentials of two different muscle fibers innervated by the same motor nerve. A motor nerve innervates many different muscle fibers. And actually, you think that the pulses go down and, and activate them all completely simultaneously because that's what it looks like in real life, but they don't. Some that, you know, will be activated slightly sooner than others, and there's a, a differential, a, a time difference between them. Well, in my senior gravis, that time difference gets bigger. Okay, so it's called increased jitter. And you can see here in the picture, um, uh, the, I guess the, uh, the second peak in particular shows that those action potential, potentials are not lining up there's a variation in when they're appearing. So that's increased jitter and that suggests myasthenia. If this is detected on a single fiber, uh, it, its sensitivity is nearly 100%. So if, if, you, if you don't detect this, I should say, then you can basically, with 100% certainty, say it's not myasthenia. Assuming the test was done correctly. It's not an easy test to do. Blood tests can also be helpful. So, you can look, of course, for the antibodies themselves, the ACH receptor antibodies. If you find these, it's basically myasthenia gravis. So if you see that, it's anti-ACHR myasthenia. It's 100% specificity or very close to it. You can look for anti-musk antibodies. This should be checked if you really, it's myasthenia based on history and exam, but your initial antibody testing was negative, or if you really think it's anti-musk based on the phenotype the patient's presenting with. And I always do thyroid tests for these patients just in case. Thyroid disease can really uh, mimic myasthenia quite well. Those, that's a bare bones. You might want to do more tests, such as a CK or whatnot. Okay, so thymic abnormalities are extremely common. Most patients have thymic hyperplasia, and some patients even have a thymoma. A thymoma, that is an example of one, and that's uh, a type of tumor that can be uh, fatal if it is uh, allowed to grow to a certain extent. So all patients with confirmed myasthenia, whether it's ocular or generalized, should have their uh, thymus imaged with a CT or MRI scan. Okay, so to diagnose myasthenia gravis, first identify on history uh, and exam if there's fluctuating weakness and fatigability. And when you go through and do the examination, you want to do it systematically, particularly in the physician exams, and I like to go top down. Order your neurophys tests, know why you're ordering them, so repetitive nerve stimulation. Uh, you're looking for decrement, single fiber EMG for your increased jitter, and order blood tests as well, and a CT, neck and chest, MRI, if, if you think that's more reasonable. Treating myasthenia. This is, a, this is not that easy either, uh, th but there's a, a good way to approach it. The first is to think, how severe is this myasthenia and who is the patient in front of me? And based on those two variables, implement the most appropriate therapy. And often it's a combined approach of two or more therapy uh, treatments. And then monitor them and watch for relapses. Myasthenia is very finicky. It can relapse very quickly compared to other disorders. So, and I, I re respect it more now than I, I used to. So when we classify severity, there's this MGFA, or Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America, classification scheme that's very simple. And it's encouraged. It's subjective, but I think people are pretty good at assessing this. So class one is just eye symptoms. Class two, mild weakness of any non-ocular muscle. Of course, they're focusing on weakness, unfortunately, rather than fatigability, but hey. Class three is a moderate weakness of any non-ocular muscle. Class four, severe weakness of any non-ocular muscle. Class five means they're intubated in ICU. So that's the, the way to classify severity of myasthenia gravis. Patient context is the other important variable. Everyone's a little different. Think about age. So some drug treatments are better in younger people. Some are more appropriate for older people. Pregnancy. Uh, myasthenia is funny in pregnancy. It can get better, it can get worse, it can stay the same and be quiescent. So um, treating it's a bit tricky, but some drugs should definitely be avoided in pregnancy. Think about the subtype. Anti-musk responds really well to some therapies, not very well at all to some other therapies. And comorbidities, you should always think of these when you're starting a drug. For example, do you don't want to do high-dose steroids in someone with type 2 diabetes, unless you have to. All right, so there are four types of treatments for myasthenia, and the best depends on, again, the clinical severity, class one to five, and the patient characteristics. 
So you can have symptomatic treatments alone, so your acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, like Dr. Walker's uh, peridostigmine, chronic immunosuppression with corticosteroids or non-steroidal drugs, there are a number of those. Immunosuppression for a severe disease or crisis, so class four, class five, you want to use IVIG or Plex, which I alluded to earlier, and surgery. So you can, removing the thymus can be very beneficial for the symptoms. The acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are first-line treatments. You can try this alone in someone who's just got ocular myasthenia or, or whatever, and they're really not too bothered by it. Um, Peridostigmine, also known as mestinon in New Zealand, is a good choice. And what they do is they indirectly prevent acetylcholine breakdown, which allows the acetylcholine to stay in that synaptic cleft longer than it would otherwise, even though there's antibodies against it there. So peridostigmine acts within 15 to 30 minutes. It peaks at two hours. It only lasts three to four hours. So really, if you want to use this, you should be asking the patient to do it three or four times a day. Uh, some people don't need it that much for various reasons, but generally, it, it doesn't last long. Adverse effects, again, you should always know the top two or three adverse effects of any medication you prescribe and tell them to the, the patient. Abdominal cramps, diarrhea, nausea, sweating, muscle cramps, these kinds of things are quite common. And they are safe in pregnancy. They are not very effective against anti-musk. You can try them, but they probably won't work too well. May not work at all. Steroids. We, that's the next line. So steroids are added with symptoms are not controlled by the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors alone. So now we can add some prednisone on to the peridostigmine. Steroids, of course, have multiple mechanisms. We use them in a wide spectrum of disorders, but generally, in this context, they inhibit the immune system. This is an autoimmune disorder, so inhibiting the immune system is an obvious thing to do. Prednisone is the most common one we use. Very careful, I've seen this uh, probably four or five times now. If you start the prednisone too high in someone with myasthenia and they're in a relapse, the relapse may temporarily get worse for a few days before it gets better. And that I have seen that tilt a couple people into a higher level of care, such as someone who was on the wards needed HDU. So it's okay if you need the steroid, that's fine. But um, and it's great if they're already intubated. You know, it doesn't matter if you really make them temporarily worse for a few days. They're intubated anyways. But just be aware of this side effect. It is pretty common. So start it at a low dose and then build it up slowly. Adverse effects, there are so many with steroids, hypertension, osteoporosis, diabetes, cataracts, weight gain, just a few of them. Um, always mention those to patients and put it in the context of the disorder. If you just said that and didn't say it will help you, then nobody would want to go on the drug, of course. The steroids slightly increase the risk of cleft palate in pregnancy, uh, particularly in the first trimester. Afterwards, they're pretty safe, so they can be used later on just um, make sure you uh, explain these things to the patient and think about it. Non-steroidal drugs can be added or used in lieu of steroids if you need to, because uh, what they do is they allow the, the steroids to be used at a very low dose. So it's not, you can keep someone going along, say, 10 milligrams of prednisone daily, which is a very low dose, or 5 to 10 milligrams, if you have a non-steroidal drug in there and can control the myasthenia quite well. The two most common are isothioprine and mycophenolate. They have similar mechanisms. They... Acetylopine takes several months to work, unfortunately, so it's not going to work the next day after you start it. It has uh, potentially negative effects on the liver, leukopenia, and in the long term can induce certain types of cancer. Mycophenolate is basically the same. It has a higher chance of GI bleeds and anemia, and of course, the long term risk of cancer. So these two, uh, this is debated, and I know uh, some of my colleagues. Uh, Dr. Koshi is not here, will have a different opinion, but I don't favor them in the young or pregnant uh, pe uh, people who are obviously going to be young as well, because uh, the long-term risk of cancer, you, you know, I'm, I'm not sure it's, it's a good trade-off. If someone is quite elderly, then, and, you know, the long-term risk of cancer that becomes a, a long-term side effect that you, you may not have to worry about, so they would be great in those patients. So I don't know, just think about it. As long as you think about it, that's the main thing. Rituximab is another uh, monoclonal antibody that can be used in lieu of steroids. And this depletes B lymphocytes. Now it's very good in myasthenia with uh, very high response rates. Its adverse effects are pretty mild, mainly infusion reaction related adverse effects. 
it can produce a dramatic response in anti-musk as well, with improvement in virtually all of those patients. So this probably is the most superior option out of all the ones we've discussed so far. The trouble is, of course, it's, it's a little harder to obtain at this point in time. Uh, but that is changing, I think, and it may change more in the future. Then there are these uh, harder hitting drugs, which we use in the severe myasthenia cases. So IVIG, what it does, we don't know the mechanism particularly, but probably what it does is, is you swamp the patient with antibodies, and that somehow reduces the antibody production by the patient against the neuromuscular junction, it's like a feedback mechanism. That might be how it works. And the adverse effects are, are pretty mild. Again, a lot of them are infusion-related or thrombosis. Plex just simply removes the antibodies from the circulation, and you give an exchange every two days, usually four to six total. You can do more if you need to. It has a few adverse effects, which I've listed there too. Basically, you can see how these two treatments um, really hit the antibody production in a very hard way, uh, but they are generally reserved for more severe myasthenia. So which one's better out of those two? IVIG has fewer adverse effects. It's less invasive because you don't need a line, uh, or a central line anyways, as Plex is often used with. But there have been some studies comparing IVIG against Plex, and they don't really show an appreciable difference. Now, that being said, there probably is a difference. There are two exceptions. The Plex does hold a slight edge over the IVIG for anti-musk myasthenia. It works better. And it's probably better for the class five ventilator dependent myasthenia. So on odds, go with Plex. Uh, of course, IVIG is probably a little easier to obtain. For example, um, we offer Plex at Waikato Hospital, but a lot of our um, neighboring hospitals do not, although they do have IVIG. And both are pretty safe in pregnancy if you need to use them. Surgery. So again, 10 to 15% of these patients have a thymoma which can be a serious problem, and it can be more of a problem than the myasthenia. 70% of these patients had, can have the, their thymoma removed, and that uh, often improves the myasthenia. 30%, the thymoma is too, um, it's, it's spread too much, and it can't be surgically removed. I've had um, seen a couple patients with that. However, the majority of patients with myasthenia gravis don't have a thymoma. They have thymic hyperplasia, so just increased growth. And we call that non-thymomatous myasthenia gravis. It's always been unsure whether a thymectomy would be beneficial in those people. But uh, there was a pretty good study uh, it's six years ago now. It's kind of hard to believe. That suggested thymectomy in non-thymomatous myasthenia. So people who have thymic hyperplasia but no thymoma may also derive benefit. They looked at people specifically, though, who were on the young side, had generalized myasthenia for less than five years, and had an antibody level over one, uh, over a certain level. Don't worry about the actual level. So that's the patient population they looked at and suggested that there was some benefit. There's still some debate about that, um, but I, it was a pretty good trial. It was a randomized trial. Regardless of whatever treatment you use, out of all the ones I just mentioned, it's a very good idea to monitor the clinical response using a quantifiable scale rather than just going, oh, they seem better. So the quantitative myasthenia gravis score scale is useful. I recommend this. It's quite simple. So it grades the myasthenia um, by a, a series of uh, questions and observations. And then you just circle down which of those categories that the patient falls into and the scores out of 30. So those are the categories. It's from none, mild, moderate, severe score, total on the right. And uh, you can follow them with that every three months or even quicker, any, any period of time that you want. Again, my senior gravis can relapse very quickly. It's, I, I respect this disorder for its ability to suddenly worsen very quickly, more than almost any other. Just, so just keep an eye on it. They can, the breathing can suddenly go overnight, and they can run into real trouble before, before you know it. So a treatment approach, to put that all in summary form, is classify the myasthenia clinically and consider the patient in front of you. So class one to five severity, consider the patient, particularly age, pregnancy, status, myasthenia subtype, and comorbidities. 
implement the most appropriate therapy. So for the, for the less severe classes, you can go with an acetylcholinase inhibitor, uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, plus or minus steroid, maybe throw in a non-steroidal drug like azathioprine or mycophenolate. For the more severe classes, you might want to do IVIG and or Plex. You might even want to do IVIG or Plex on an ongoing basis. IVIG, they can both be given sort of every four to, four to six weeks or whatever. If there's an operable thymoma, probably should be removed. If there's no thymoma, so non-thymomatous myasthenia gravis, consider surgery if they meet these criteria. Monitor the treatment effects somehow. The quantitative uh, scale I mentioned is good. So conclusions. Please remember that myasthenia is about fluctuating weakness and fatigability, not, it, not the grave muscle weakness which, uh, after which it is named. The tests are confirmatory. So you should be making this diagnosis based on history and exam and confirming with the tests. Imaging of the thymus is critical to exclude a thymoma. And before you jump to treatment, really think about this patient, which treatment is the best, because there are quite a few options now. And uh, consider the adverse effect potential. And once that's done, uh, once you implement the cho chosen treatment and decide on surgery a year and a, just monitor them. And again, this is a success story in medicine, this one. So you, you can get a fantastic response and, and keep that myasthenia subdued indefinitely if you do this correctly. Thank you very much.